Well, happy Easter. Thank you for joining us for our service today online here at Byron Community Church. As we take time out of our day to turn to the scriptures, to take in a sermon and some personal reflections, let's just pause for a moment and pray over our time together. Would you bow your heads with me? Papa God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together in this way online as we turn to your scriptures, as we pause and reflect and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the love, and the life, and the hope that we have in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. We want to begin our time together by turning to the scriptures today. We're going to be reading John 20, 24 to 30, and Pastor John's going to pick up on these passages in just a few moments. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Amen. It confirms the importance of praying for God's will in my life. Jesus asked for his cup of suffering to be taken, but he also prayed for God's will to be done. Answers to our prayer isn't always what we want, but we have to be okay with it. God's will may be contrary to our own, and to be at peace with his will is the only way to fully trust him. Jesus was vindicated through the will of God. We will be redeemed through Jesus as we put our faith in God's will. All things were good for those who love. I do believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, I was raised in a family that taught about that, but I think it comes to a point in everybody's life where you have to decide that for yourself. And by the time I got to that age, it was too late because I had already had that experience of a, of a relationship with God. And that can only come if Jesus rose from the dead. It's because it gives me um, an unbelievable amount of hope um, that there is something better uh, waiting. I guess the long answer is that um, it seems to make a lot of sense. A lot of the Bible to me is a narrative that is pointing and directing behaviors and people in a direction. Um, and then when Jesus comes along, it's this inflection point um, that really turns it into something different. And you realize that that narrative is pointing towards Jesus. And his uh, resurrection is the fulfillment of that. Sometimes God's power can be better shown through our suffering. <sighs> for it is in the darkness that we search for the light. Jesus rose from the dead with the same power we are given through God. The only way we can find purpose in our suffering is through Jesus alone. Yes, because if not, it would just be a myth. But at the same time, I don't require any sort of archaeological evidence because, again, I've had that experience with God and I take him at his word. And the Bible says it happens, so I take that. And I think to me that is actually the most, one of the most important things because uh, it kind of puts skin in the game, so to speak. It, it creates this intersection of the spiritual and the real, and it makes uh, the sacrifice of Jesus all that more real and intimate and, um, and human. Um, and, it, and it separates it from other religions and other ways of thinking about, about things in that it, um, it really makes it real and it really makes it possible to have a relationship with God because it, that really died. I can't 
believe it's true. That was my reaction to that phone call several years ago. Uh, I was a blend of shocked and skeptical. Actually, a little bit of shock and a whole lot of skepticism. Are you sure she's dead? I asked the caller. Well, the caller affirmed that, yeah, that was the bad news that she was sharing with me. So I pushed her a little further. And I said, you know, I mean, I was just talking to the dearly deceased woman's daughter. And the daughter was upbeat. She was very excited about an upcoming church event. And she didn't even give me a hint that her mother had died. Now, I told my caller that the daughter could be in denial, but what if? What if this news about her mom's death was premature, inaccurate, or just dead wrong? I encouraged my caller to go back, uh, check again with your source. The source was uh, another woman in the church. My phone caller agreed that she would do so. In the meantime, and unfortunately, this very same source had contacted another woman here in the church. Uh, I'll call her caller number two because she called, but she didn't call me. She called the home of the supposedly deceased woman. She got the daughter on the phone and began to offer her condolences. Well, the daughter was startled. She was shocked. And she cried out, what do you mean my mom's dead? She's not dead. She's very much alive. But if you can believe it, caller number two, the woman who called to offer condolences, asked her, well, are you sure she's alive? Well, the young lady, the daughter of the supposedly deceased woman says, well, I'm going to let you talk to her. She's sitting here, clearly alive, right across the table from me. Well, to make a long story short, this source had opened up the newspaper that morning and had looked at the obituaries and noticed the listing for a woman with the same name as our church member with the two daughters. The source rather than reading the details of the obituary, assumed that it was the woman. What a mess. Now, this would be a good illustration for the danger of assumptions. But here's my point this morning, and I hope you noticed it. Uh, I had my doubts. I doubted that the woman was dead and my doubt was warranted. Caller number two, the woman who called to offer condolences, she doubted that the woman was alive. Are you sure, she asked. Uh, her skepticism was unfounded. Uh, it was misplaced. You know, we live in a world of doubt. Who can you believe? What can you believe? Is this true? Is that true? Or is it the case that at times like this, the only thing certain is uncertainty? I mean, no wonder there's all of this fact-checking uh, as a way of combating fake news. 
th there's this quest for reliable sources with the inference that a lot of sources aren't reliable. Or even newspaper headlines. Did you see this one the other day in our London Free Press? Substantial uncertainty. Now, a headline like that just uh, stokes our uncertainty and our doubt when it comes to vaccine safety. Hey, are we supposed to believe anything and everything? If that was the case, I would be a very rich man. Just a few days ago, I got yet another notice that a widow in Africa wanted to leave me $7 million. Yeah, right. No one wants to be gullible. You want, you don't want to be conned. I'm sure you don't want to be duped. You don't want to be anyone's April Fool. But at a time like this, especially on Easter weekend 2021, it's why I believe our topic today is so profoundly relevant. No doubt. Really? Today I want us to look at a resurrection story from that first Easter that is recorded in John 20. It's a story that's going to provide us insights and it's going to inspire you and me no matter where we're on the doubt spectrum or where we're at in our spiritual journey. My title this morning is No Doubt. Now, just a few observations right at the start. Uh, doubt is a huge topic. It, it's a very complex issue. There are so many dynamics when it comes to doubt. Um, in fact, if we were to try to cover all the aspects of doubt, it, it couldn't be done way beyond the scope of the time allotted for this sermon. In fact, I, I think in some ways we need to have kind of like a funnel approach moving from broad to narrow. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, doubt is very intriguing. We could look at the psychology of doubt, but as we narrow the focus, we can think of spiritual doubt and how doubt relates to faith and matters of belief. But today we have an even more particular focus because this is Easter weekend. And I want to specifically look at how doubt relates to this matter of the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or, to put it in other words, is the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus an actual, real, historical fact? Now, earlier in this service, you heard a number of reflections. And I want to thank Susan and Leah and David for their contribution to the service this morning. I'm sure in their responses, like me, you picked up that one size doesn't fit all. There were different expressions of faith and experience and even how each of them approached the question or the questions asked. And I think you would agree with me that it demonstrated the authenticity of this exercise. There wasn't the same script that each participant was reading. But there were a couple of common denominators. One thing that was in common was the expression of resurrection faith. The other thing that I noticed was that it mattered to all three of our participants. It mattered to them that the resurrection is a real historical event. Now, how would you answer those questions? Why do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Does it matter to you 
that the resurrection is a real historical event. But let me ask another question. What about doubt? What about doubt for you and maybe others around you? Maybe a a family member, a friend, or a neighbor? Where does doubt fit into the equation? Now, I know some of you may say, John, um, when it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to the resurrection, um, I accept it without a doubt. In fact, I remember someone years ago saying to me, I never really questioned my resurrection faith until someone tried to prove it. And I'm always very aware of that concern. Maybe you're a person who will say, uh, well, I have some doubts. I have some questions. Uh, Or maybe today you're listening and you're saying, John, I have lots and lots of hard questions. I'm wrestling with doubt. I'm struggling with skepticism. And sometimes you may feel like it's like hiding Easter eggs. Uh, You know, you you don't want to be open about your doubts. Uh, You don't want to disclose your questions for fear you might spoil Easter for others. But these questions uh, provoke more questions. Um, Can we offer hope to those who struggle with doubt? Uh, Is there a difference between a Christ follower doubting and a person who isn't a Christ follower experiencing doubt? Hey, can a Christ follower doubt? Is it okay to have honest questions and, and doubts? Or I guess I could ask, can faith and doubt coexist? And are there different kinds of doubt? Um, Are there different reasons behind why people doubt? I guess I could ask another question. Can doubt or skepticism ever serve a noble purpose? But on the other hand, especially for those struggling or wrestling with doubt, What do you do when it seems like these doubts and these questions are stifling your spiritual progress? These are good questions I hope in some way we can address this morning. But I want to present to to you, just before we look at our text, a a bit of a thesis. Actually, it's a a two-model paradigm that I've developed over the last couple of weeks Uh, The first model, model A, is what I call the optimal model or optimal paradigm. It has three stages. The first stage is what I call healthy doubt, uh, honest questions. But that moves into the second stage, a critical stage, again with this optimal model, and that's what I call the need to resolve those doubts to deal with these doubts in a very open and transparent way. And then that third stage, that stage of hope, is where you can have your faith go beyond these doubts and questions, where you end up with a strong faith. Oh, you may still have some questions. There may still be seasons of doubt, but you are girded by a strong faith. Now, model B is what I call the problematic model. Uh, This is where doubt is unhealthy. Uh, We're not talking often about sincere doubt, but we're talking about maybe smokescreen guilt, where doubt is a smokescreen. It is uh, an excuse for maybe avoiding a decision for Jesus Christ. Now, Another possibility is that someone who is at that second stage in the optimal model, rather than dealing with doubt, uh, a willingness to resolve it, uh, lets it go unattended. And they too can fall into that model B, that problematic model. 
because in the second stage of the problematic model, doubt goes unresolved. Doubt is left to fester. This is a, rather than a constructive way of dealing with doubt, it's very destructive. And the third stage of the problematic model is what I call unbelief. It's where a person, rather than choosing to believe, chooses unbelief. Well, this all leads us now, rather than just parking on theories around spiritual doubt, to a story about doubt. Earlier, Pastor Josh read for us from John 20, and I'm going to ask you to turn again to this passage in John chapter 20, and we're going to look at the story of Jesus appearing to Thomas. This is a great Easter story, uh, looking at Easter Sunday, that first Easter Sunday, and a week later, but again, a story that has wonderful insights for us, helps us deal with some of the questions that we've asked earlier in this sermon. So let's walk through these verses. In John 20, verse 24, it begins with the the phrase, now Thomas, also known as Didymus. Didymus, actually a Greek word that means twin. I don't know anything about Thomas's twin, but we do know some things about Thomas before he shows up here in John 20. Um, When we think of Thomas, many of us think of doubting Thomas. Um, And and, and there's a a level of of meaning to that. I I think in some ways it's a bit unfair. I think that Thomas gets a raw deal when he's only looked at that in that way. Uh, We do know earlier in John, in John 11, the portrait of Thomas is that uh, he, he, he may have had a melancholy personality. He, he could be a bit negative. He could be a bit pessimistic. But in John 11, when Jesus talked about having to die, Thomas expresses a willingness to die with Jesus. So like a lot of pessimistic people I know, Thomas was loyal. He, he was very faithful. And let, him, let us give him credit for that. But, but the other thing that I find remarkable about Thomas, and we see this in John 14, is that Thomas was very honest. Um, when, remember Jesus is telling the disciples, and this is a passage that we use a lot at funerals, that he's going to prepare a place and he's going to come back for them that they may go where he is. And, and it's Thomas who blurts out the question, Jesus we don't know where you're going, so how do you expect us to get there? Like a great question with an even greater answer. Thomas's question, his honest question, is a catalyst for Jesus' great response. And you know it. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Hey, I'm glad that Thomas asked this honest question. So this is Thomas. And we're told that that first Easter Sunday, earlier in the day, he is not with the disciples when Jesus came. Where was Thomas? We don't know. Was he running late? Did he have another appointment? I don't know, but he wasn't there. So the other disciples told him what had happened earlier. We have seen the Lord. I'm sure they were excited, going, hey, Thomas, give us a high five. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Now please notice, Thomas said, uh, did not say, I will never believe. I refuse in spite of all of the evidence you could give me to believe. But he had a demand. He had some conditions. And he expressed that to, uh, to the other disciples. Now, this is a good point for us where we can pause here and talk about what I addressed earlier as the spectrum of doubt. Be assured, Thomas is not the only person we read of in the Bible who struggled with doubt. Think of David. Read through the Psalms, and uh, you'll see many times where David expressed doubt concern, 
hard questions, even skepticism. Then you have a story earlier in the gospel accounts that's actually quite disturbing. I mean, John the Baptist, of all people, evidently struggled with doubt. As John the Baptist was in prison, he sent some of his disciples to Jesus and his disciples, and basically John was saying, I'm not sure anymore. I I need to affirm that Jesus is really who he says he is. Why did John struggle with these doubts? Yeah, he was in prison, but there's a bit of a randomness to his doubts. And then what's uh, also something you need to note is that in the gospel accounts, uh, in terms of the uh, resurrection, in every gospel account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see that there were many disciples who struggled with, with doubt. It wasn't just Thomas. Now, Thomas is singled out here because of the occasion, but doubt seemed to be a, a very common response as the disciples reacted to what happened uh, that first Easter. The spectrum of doubt. Now, there are some of you who can say sincerely that you just accept the resurrection story without doubt. In fact, you could say, uh, John, I really don't struggle with doubt. It's just never been part of my uh, faith journey. And I applaud that. I appreciate that. I I do have a caution. Unfortunately, I've had to deal with some people who that would have been their experience, but for whatever reason, they go through a season of life or there is an event that triggers doubt and hard questions when it comes to their faith. So I'm not going to say to you this morning, if if you're a no-doubt person, I'm going to try to change that. Not at all. But I do want to give that caution and that bit of a warning. Now, there are those also on the doubt spectrum who have, maybe at the opposite end, a hardened disposition. You know and I know that you could present all the evidence, you could present all the facts. Jesus himself could show right up at that person's doorstep, and they would choose not to believe. They have a hardened heart. Many many times, I I use the term a smokescreen, It's like a defense mechanism. It's a person who says, if I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, what will that mean? What will the implications be for my life? And they're afraid of that. And so doubt becomes an excuse. It becomes a smokescreen supporting uh, their reasoning for not believing. In some cases, um, doubt has to do with disappointment with God. That could have been a factor with John the Baptist. Um, Maybe he was uh, disturbed that he was in prison. He knew that he was uh, about to be beheaded. Um, Often I've seen it and you've seen it where a crisis in a person's life, a disturbing event can disturb or shake their faith. So be aware it's kind of an emotional doubt. But there are those also who have what we call on the spectrum intellectual doubt. They have hard questions. They ask those questions in that intellectual manner. A final uh, doubter is what we call congenital doubters. These are people who, it's just the way they're wired. Maybe the way they were born, maybe they had uh, some issues of uh, violated trust in their past, but That's their go-to position. They're always going, but what if? But what if? What about that? What about this? It's just kind of the way they're wired. Now, what I've discovered is that uh, it's just not one kind of doubt that can impact a person. There can be a combination or a blend of all five. Uh, I think you'd agree with me that Thomas was likely wrestling with uh, intellectual doubt. Uh, when it came to accepting uh, what had happened that first Easter. Now, was there any noble purpose to his doubt? 
anything good coming out of it. I actually believe, especially for our sake, uh, quite significantly, there was a positive impact. I mean, Thomas, by his protest, establishes that he believed that Jesus was dead. Um, he, he demanded to see the one he knew had died. There's a theory that was circulating that Jesus had a twin brother, and the twin brother went to the cross instead of Jesus himself. But for Thomas, though we'll discover that Jesus had an ability to uh, go through walls and lock doors, there, there had to be a continuity between uh, Jesus' pre-resurrection body and his body post-resurrection. And, and this is what Thomas was looking for, evidence of that physical bodily resurrection of Jesus. So for Thomas, the idea of resurrection being a hallucination or a hoax or the product of wishful thinking or let's just make believe or worse still, some kind of myth they develop later that Easter Sunday morning, it just wasn't going to cut it for Thomas. So that was good. Now, the negative side of his skepticism was he didn't take his buddies at their word. Um, I, I don't think they had any reason to be uh, de deliberately deceitful. But Thomas mistrusted it. He just wasn't confident that uh, this is what had happened. What I love, though, is that um, Thomas is there. They, there, there's no evidence that when he made that uh, demand, the other said, Thomas, we're indignant with you. We're kicking you out. This is no place to express some kind of uh, doubt or skepticism. I, I guess you could put it this way. They didn't shame Thomas. It was okay for Thomas to express doubt and some of this uh, honest concern. Oz Guinness, the uh, brilliant uh, British... Christ follower, a real academic, has said, um, the shame is not that people have doubts, but that people are ashamed of them. I want to be in an environment like that room where people are given permission to express doubt, hard questions, and concerns, where we pledge to deal with them and help them resolve them, but still it's that kind of open place. Well, let's see what happens next. We're told a week later his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. I am delighted like you are that they didn't shun him. Thomas stuck around. He had his doubts. He had his questions, but he was still part of the group. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. His typical greeting, peace be with you. <clears throat> then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. There's so much I love about this encounter. You remember last summer, Josh and I looked at a series called Encounters with Jesus. And there's something that is so poignant and personal about this. Jesus didn't come in and give Thomas a lecture or ignore him, worse still. But he approached Thomas. I really believe it was very gent gently and tenderly. This isn't a prescription here. This is not how Thomas or, or how Jesus approaches anyone who doubts, anyone who has skepticism. But it is a description of what happened in Thomas's experience. And what we see here, the real lesson here, is that when we have these hard questions, uh, Jesus can handle our doubts. He can handle your hard questions and my hard questions. And, and in fact, we see this principle of revelation demanding a response. Jesus reveals himself in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of methods, and here, in a very dramatic way, he reveals himself to Thomas. He then kind of has a bottom line. It's like, okay, Thomas, you've asked for this kind of evidence. I've provided it. 
Now you need to make a choice. Be willing to resolve that doubt. Stop doubting and believe. Now, I don't want to be nitpicky here, but the Greek word is better translated, stop unbelieving and believe. Uh, I think what Jesus is very concerned about is, Thomas, you may still have a few questions. You may still have a few concerns. Later, you may even wrestle with some doubts. But at this important juncture, you need to make a choice. Stop unbelieving and choose to believe. And look at how Thomas responded. He said to him, my Lord and my God. Now, this is a bit of a surprise. We would expect Thomas to have said something that would have been very appropriate. Oh, Jesus, I believe in the resurrection. But Thomas goes to the high point of a faith response. It's more than just saying, I believe in the resurrection. I believe in you, my risen Lord Jesus Christ, my God. What I really enjoyed about our participants who shared earlier in this service is their responses weren't necessarily academic, but they sure were relational. Can you believe it? I know some people who believe in the resurrection as a historical fact, but they don't believe in Jesus. They haven't put their trust and confidence in him. In the New Testament, the word for believe is an action word. It's more than just intellectual assent or an agreement with some facts. It is the act of trusting, putting one's confidence, putting one's faith in a thing or in a person. And this is what Thomas does in a powerful way. Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. I don't think this is a rebuke. I think Jesus is affirming Thomas's faith. But then Jesus adds, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's people like you and me. That's people who would come to faith after Jesus' ascension. Um, blessing means, in, in one way, happiness. We talk about happy Easter. I'm not sure the full extent of the blessing that Jesus promises us, but we know that Jesus displays his goodness and mercy to us, his grace to us. Just like Thomas, he does it by revelation. In fact, John finishes this section with his theme of the whole gospel statement. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What we have here is a revelation of written record. We have these resurrection appearances that are recorded for our benefit. Are these resurrection appearances absolute proof? Let me say something that um, may alarm you. I, I don't believe in the principle of absolute proof. If we had a long time, I could explain that philosophically. But I do believe in what we call reasonable evidence. Is there reasonable evidence that's a basis for your faith and my faith in our risen Lord Jesus Christ? You better believe it. It's strong and it's there. So let me close off with a few summary statements and, uh, and implications. Um, I, I think I want us to think a little bit about what I call the two A's. First of all, appreciate the variety and diversity on that doubt spectrum. Make sure you appreciate the reasons why you may not believe, but think about 
the reasons why a family member, a neighbor, a friend may be wrestling with doubt. The other A is what we might label as apologetics. Uh, we are told in 1 Peter that we are to be able to give a reason, to be able to defend what it is that we believe in. Uh, apologetics comes from the Greek court. It's a word that actually means to give a defense of, to uh, give proof or evidence of uh, our hope and our faith in Jesus Christ. And they're excellent resources. One of the resources that I recommend often, I've done that for some of you recently, is a book by Doug Powell on apologetics. If you're interested, reach out to me and I can give you more detail. All of the Lee Strobel stuff is really good. We have a lot of that here in the church library where we're taping today. And uh, there's even some DVDs, and, and th these are very helpful as well. I think of Erwin Lutzer, a Canadian pastor who served at Moody Bible Church for years, and uh, he would come up with what he called the 21-day challenge, where you read through the whole Gospel of John. If you've got doubts, if you've got great questions, if you have concerns, uh, make it that a, a, a personal goal, a quest, to uh, resolve some of your doubts, to deal with some of your questions in that kind of up-close and personal way as you read through the Gospel of John. I, I want to talk a little bit about the role of resurrection faith. We asked our participants in the exercise this morning, does it matter to you if uh, it's a historical fact that Jesus has risen from the dead? I just want to declare it really does matter. There's a lot of people this morning and this weekend are going to say, oh, I believe in the resurrection. It, it's kind of a symbol. It's kind of like a myth that reminds people that the teaching of Jesus, the example of Jesus, what he stood for lives on. Now, we believe much more than that. The person of Jesus Christ, God raised him from the dead. He is alive. Yes, his teachings live on. His uh, moral uh, compass uh, for us lives on. But it's Jesus, the person of Jesus, who lives on. Paul says, and he, of course, bases this argument on all these resurrection appearances. That's his go-to. Doesn't talk a lot about the empty tomb in 1 Corinthians 15, but he sure talks a lot about all these appearances. Some of the people who uh, Jesus appeared to continue to live when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, but then Paul comes to his big argument, which is, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, we're hopeless. We're to be pitied. This isn't worth it. We might as well just throw away the Christian faith because the Christian faith rests on it. And then you remember Paul's great declaration. But on the basis of the evidence of this reasonable proof, Jesus has been raised. He is risen indeed. Hey, I just want to talk briefly about um, helping others. We recognize that you may struggle with uh, doubt, but helping others, I just have Three P words. Be present. Be available. Um, don't shun someone. Don't shame someone. Just be there. Live out your resurrection faith before them so they can see it. But be willing to talk with them and wrestle with some of the questions that they might have with them. So be present. Be patient. I mean, the disciples were patient with Thomas. I, I understand you might go, oh, this person's always asking a question, another question, and even another question, but be patient. Uh, God loves them, and we need to love them uh, into the kingdom. And then third, be prepared. Um, always be ready to give a reason. So when they ask some of these tough questions, you know, why does God allow suffering in the world? Uh, why is there a hell? Um, what about all the other religions? Be prepared. Be ready to respond to these kinds of inquiries and questions. 
Uh, faith is a choice. I've said that a few times this morning. I believe ultimately that doubt is a choice and faith is a choice. And I want to encourage you to make the right kind of choice. Hey, all kinds of people have struggled with doubt. Did you know that even Billy Graham struggled with doubt? Uh, we think of Billy Graham as one of the greatest preachers ever. But Billy Graham tells us of a very deep valley he was in where he was wrestling with and struggling with doubt, and he came to a point where he made a decision. He said, I decided to allow faith to go beyond my doubts and questions. Did you know that Graham, through his lifetime, always wrestled with some doubts and some questions? He had that kind of authentic, honest approach to his Christianity, but he made a choice. That was, I will choose to allow faith to go beyond. I will choose my faith, my confidence in Jesus and his resurrection and all his claims. I will allow those to prevail over any of my doubts and hard questions. Think of the thesis again, where I've said that um, sincere doubt needs to lead to a commitment to resolve our doubts, to deal with them. And the goal is to get to that point where we experience a strong and vital and a vibrant faith. You may say, John, I just have little faith. I, I, it needs to grow, it needs to flourish, and I get that. But always remember, more important than the magnitude of our faith is the magnitude of the object of our faith, who we put our faith in, what we're placing our confidence in. Kind of like the illustration of ice. Um, you can have a lot of faith in very thin ice. You can go out on a lake and the ice is too thin, but you've got a lot of faith, and you're very sincere about what you believe about the ice, but you're still going to fall through as it cracks open. Someone may have little faith, but they have ventured out onto thick ice. It's going to hold them. It's going to support them. It's all about the object of faith. If you put your faith and trust and confidence in Jesus Christ, if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you will not be disappointed. Real faith can overcome and prevail and be victorious over our doubts. We have a tradition here at Byron Community Church every Easter. It's that old Orthodox greeting where the leader, pastor, priest cries out, He is risen. And then others respond, he is risen indeed. Hey, as you're watching this particular on-screen, online presentation, will you respond as I cry out? He is risen! I heard you, but we can do better. He is risen! And finally, he is risen. Amen.